from Columbia University. Mike was an undergraduate at UPenn in economics. He went to Yale to study law, and then uh, he decided to go to pursue a PhD in economics, a wise move. And he taught at uh, Chicago, Princeton, and he's at Columbia now for since 2004. He has uh, numerous important contributions in macroeconomics and monetary theory, and is in an honor for us to have him here. And as a matter of fact, he reminded me that he was one of the starting co-editors of economic theory. It goes back to the 90s, and it's a great pleasure and an honor to have you here again. Thanks. So it's a, it's, a, it's a great honor to be asked to, uh, to give one of these uh, sessions in honor of Aloysio Arujo. Uh, Aloysio has been a good friend for uh, decades now and um, also someone I've enjoyed very much working with as a co-author. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is not uh, the area that I've been uh, and continue, am continuing to work with Aloysio on. It's something that I'm hoping I can uh, get him interested in. Um, one of the things that you all know Aloysio is, is, is very well known for is his work on very careful analysis of methods of dynamic optimization. And um, this is, of course, a tool of very great use in, in many areas of economics, uh, starting with growth theory and finance, but by now many other areas as well. In this talk, I'm going to try to argue that um, dynamic optimization techniques can also be useful for understanding better uh, an example of a problem that might initially not seem to involve dynamics at all. I'm going to talk about a type of simple choice problem where there's a one-time decision to be made. Uh, there's some unknown state of the world that affects the payoff from actions, but the state of the world is not going to change in the model that I'm describing. Uh, I'm going to argue that nonetheless reformulating the problem as involving a dynamic optimization element um, leads to insight into the structure of the problem that Ben uh, Hebert, my co-author who's at Stanford, and I think um, uh, provide useful insights into the nature of this problem. So the issue we're concerned with is how to model inattention. And I, uh, I guess I probably need to start by saying what exactly we have in mind by inattentiveness in choice. Of course, standard rational choice theory tries to explain behavior as being optimal from the standpoint of some coherent objective, uh, specifically assuming that the decision maker has a correct understanding of the properties of the options that they're choosing between. And I've bolded that because that's the thing we're interested in relaxing. Theories of inattention relax that assumption that the decision maker bases the decision on an exactly correct understanding of the choice situation to instead allow choice to be based on some kind of imprecise subjective representation of that uh, situation. And examples of reasons why uh, some of us are interested in theories of this kind are to explain observed randomness in uh, people's choice behavior, uh, repeated presentations of exactly the same choice problem to a given decision maker don't always result in them making the same choice in the case at least where the difference in values to the decision maker are small enough. One observes what seems to be random variation in what they'll do on a given occasion. And we can think of this as meaning that are as resulting from the fact that their choice is based on a fuzzy representation of what the situation actually is, where in the case of small enough value differences, this fuzziness may result in randomness of what they actually choose on a given occasion. Models of this kind uh, have been proposed as ways of explaining delays in people's observed responses to changing circumstances. Of course, there are familiar ways of explaining delayed responses that assume that people always know exactly the situation they're in and there's some kind of adjustment cost or they have preferences that involve habit formation or something of that kind. Uh, but inattentiveness is also a potential hypothesis, and it's one that I think is particularly appealing as a way of explaining why people might respond quickly to changes in some aspects of their environment and with a much greater delay 
in response to changes in other aspects of the environment to which they're perhaps paying less attention. So uh, uh, that's a general description of what we're interested in being able to model. Obviously, this is a hypothesis that isn't going to make very specific predictions without saying something much more precise about what the relationship is that you think should exist or that it would make sense to exist between the actual situation and the subjective representation of the situation in the mind of a decision maker. And so this is where the hypothesis of what Chris Sims calls rational inattention, I think, becomes of interest. Uh, the idea of rational inattention is not to make arbitrary assumptions about what kind of observation errors uh, people make uh, to allow some very flexible class of possible relationships between the objective situation and the subjective representation that the decision maker may have of the situation, but to still get sharp predictions about what probability distribution of errors you would expect to be, see people make in a given decision problem by assuming that that subjective representation, that relationship between the objective situation and subjective perception is one that is optimal for a given environment, some given class of situations that the decision maker expects to be in. So to make this a little more concrete, the kind of decision problem I'm going to be talking about today is one where there's some state of the world, X, and it's in fact going to be one of a finite number of states of the world. The decision maker is going to choose an action one time, some action A from some finite set of actions, but uh, the utility from the action A will depend on what the state of the world is, but A cannot be based on what the true state of the world is. It'll have to be based on an imperfectly informative signal that the decision maker receives, which is going to be then their uh, noisy, subjective perception of what the situation is rather than the true state X. In Sims's version of rational inattention, uh, one supposes there's an information structure that specifies the conditional probabilities of different subjective perceptions or different signals conditional on the true state. Uh, there's an action selection rule that can only depend on this signal S. Those two things are both endogenously supposed to be optimized to maximize the expected utility of the action net of some cost of having more informative signals. And of course, the existence of that cost is going to be crucial to explain why it isn't just optimal to be perfectly informed. Uh, and Sims proposes a specific measure of informativeness and hence a specific type of cost function for the problem, uh, namely that the cost should be increasing in, or perhaps proportional to, Shannon's mutual information between the true state and the signal. So the definition of Shannon's mutual information for some joint distribution of two random variables is, uh, is this expression. Uh, the pi of x is the prior probability of the state x. P of s and x is the joint probability. Uh, the joint distribution of um, occurrences of true states and the subjective perception S. P of S is the implied unconditional probability of the signal. The expectation is taken over that joint distribution. You can observe that this is a measure of the degree of statistical dependence between the two random variables. If they're independent, the numerator and the denominator are identical in all states. In that expression, the log is zero. The expected value is zero. Uh, you can also show that this measure is necessarily non-negative, and in fact, it's only zero in the case of complete um, independence, and it has other uh, important properties that I won't talk about, but that's Sims's um, proposed cost function. Now, the justification for that is, um, is something I, I want to raise some questions about. One is Sims, of course, appeals to the use of this measure of information in Shannon's information theory, but um, we think that Shannon's justification for interest in this particular quantity uh, is not obviously relevant for a theory of the way limits on working memory or other kinds of attentional constraints should constrain decision making or for that matter perceptual judgments, which I'm also going to argue uh, we should view as a closely related problem and be interested in evidence, experimental evidence on um, errors in uh, perceptual judgments. The, uh, the argument that Shannon gives, and this is a mathematical theorem that, that Shannon proves, uh, he establishes that any mechanism that could be used to transmit a signal about some state, 
uh, through some physical mechanism has a particular channel capacity that can be defined. And given that channel capacity, the answer to how quickly one can transmit given signals with a given degree of accuracy is entirely answered by this mutual information measure. The mutual information between the true state that the sender of the signal knows and the pro probability distribution of reports that the receiver is going to get conditional on the true signal. But this theorem uh, depends on an assumption that some very long sequence of independent draws of the state can be encoded jointly as a block transmitted and then decoded jointly uh, by the receiver. The theorem that the only thing that matters is the mutual information isn't going to be true more generally. It's an asymptotic result in the case of joint encoding of a sufficiently long block of independent draws of the uh, message that has to be sent. And we think that that's not uh, obviously uh, the right kind of constraint to think should hold in the case of one-time decision problems where there is some state of the world, there's going to be some perception of it based on the perception of it. You have to make a decision. You can't wait for some very long sequence of observations of different decisions, code them all together, jointly perceive all of them, and then make your, choose your actions for all of them only after you've made the long sequence of observations. Apart from that, you might say, well, anyway, it's a cost function. Uh, it has many uh, appealing mathematical properties. Uh, if it also makes predictions that we like, um, we might be interested in it as a very uh, parsimonious kind of theory. We would argue that, in fact, mutual information has unappealing features as a cost function for the kind of problems we're interested in. One feature that I think is quite unappealing is it implies that any state should be equally easy or difficult to distinguish from any other state. Uh, there's no conception of states that are similar and harder to tell apart, whereas other states are very dissimilar and, and, and easy to tell apart. And you can see that from the uh, formula back here. Uh, there's nothing in this formula except the fact that there are different states. There are different ex-ante probabilities of those states occurring, but there's no notion of similarity or dissimilarity of the states that can enter into this constraint on what kind of conditional probabilities of subjective uh, representations one can have. That means that this theory of rational intention leads to a prediction that's contradicted by a great deal of experimental evidence in the case of perceptual judgments. So there's a very common type of experimental design in the, uh, in the literature on perception where the subject is presented with uh, some kind of stimulus, a visual stimulus, an auditory stimulus, or some other kind of sensory stimulus. They have to categorize it as belonging to one category or another. And in the typical setup, very often there are two choices. Uh, they're rewarded with whether the classification is correct or incorrect. They're simply supposed to be trying to make as many correct classifications as possible. In the case that the stimulus can vary in intensity, there can be stimuli that are very strongly of one kind and less strongly. It doesn't matter how wrong or how close to being right the answer was. It's simply uh, uh, right or wrong. And uh, the rational attention theory would imply that the optimal information structure under that cost function, uh, mutual information, should be one that makes the probability of a given response only depend on what the correct classification is because that's the only thing that's payoff relevant. Uh, about that state. Um, and in fact, what one commonly observes in, with the case of a stimulus that can vary in some continuous magnitude is that the probability of the subject giving a response varies continuously with the stimulus magnitude. It's not just a function of the sign, whether it's positive or negative, even though that's the only thing that's payoff relevant. So this is an example of uh, a typical uh, kind of finding in the perceptual literature. In this experiment, the stimulus is a field of moving dots. There are several hundred dots that are moving in different directions. The subject has to classify the visual stimulus as having a dominant direction of motion to the right or a dominant direction of motion to the left. On the horizontal axis, this so-called motion strength is measuring the extent to which the dominant direction of motion is to the right or to the left. The subject is re uh, rewarded for a correct answer in the case of any positive 
uh, values on the horizontal axis. The dominant direction is to the right. If they say right, it's correct. If left, it's incorrect. Uh, any negative value, left is the correct answer, right is the incorrect answer. Rational inattention would imply the probability of the subject saying right should be a step function. It should be some probability whenever it's any motion to the left, some other probability when it's any motion to the right, uh, and it can jump discontinuously. It has to jump discontinuously at zero if there's any difference between the responses given for very strong movement to the right and very strong movement to the left. Uh, the typical response of subjects is instead a monotonically increasing probability of giving the response that it looks like the dominant direction of motion is, uh, is to the right. Okay, so we're interested in proposing a different version of rational inattention. So we're not going to assume mutual information is the cost function, but we do want to still get relatively specific predictions, to have a theory that does make relatively sharp and, and testable predictions. And um, we're going to constrain then the accuracy of possible subjective representations in our theory in a different way. It's going to lead to a parametric family of what we call sequentially prior invariant cost functions. Now the idea of our approach is going to be to try to exploit structure that's implied by a hypothesis that the information about the situation is acquired by the decision maker through a sequential process of many independent observations rather than just some signal, single signal S as in the static problem that I, uh, I talked about a few minutes ago. Each of these individual observations is furthermore going to be only very slightly informative about the state, but there'll be a long sequence of them that cumulatively reveal some uh, significant amount of information about what the decision situation is. We're going to let the kind of information that the decision maker acquires through each of these individual small observations uh, be very flexibly specified. Also the question of the number of observations that will be made before deciding on the action um, is going to be allowed to be varied endogenously depending on the nature of the decision environment uh, as well. We're going to have, of course, to specify then some cost function. Uh, for, to make it costly to obtain really good information. Why assume sequential sampling as the crucial constraint on the nature of the observation process that is going to uh, drive our results? Well, there's a long literature in uh, experimental psychology and also more recently in neuroscience arguing that imprecision in perceptual judgments can be modeled quantitatively by stochastic processes that involve sequential evidence accumulation. And the reason I showed you the picture about the moving dot stimuli is because that's an example of a type of perceptual problem that's been very extensively studied, not just studied behaviorally, uh, although uh, that was the first area in which these types of models were used. But more recently, uh, there's been uh, extensive study in recent decades by neuroscientists of what's actually going on in areas of the brain involved in uh, recognition of direction of motion of visual stimuli when subjects are making um, that kind of decision. And so it's argued that many measurements of the brain as well as the variations in the probability of the subject giving one response, variations in average response time can all be well explained by a particular type of stochastic process that involves um, the random evolution of something that uh, evolves sort of like a Brownian motion with drift until it reaches a barrier, depending which barrier is reached first, the, the subject responds uh, left or right. And uh, that process uh, is connected to changes over time in the rate of spiking of different populations of neurons in these uh, 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 visual, um, uh, visual areas of the brain. A smaller and more recent literature, uh, some people, Antonio Rangel and co-authors in particular, have argued that similar models of sequential sampling provide pretty good fits to experimental data on stochastic choice between, in the laboratory, between alternative goods, say alternative food items chosen by hungry Caltech uh, students. Uh, Antonio and uh, Ernst Fair have a survey paper in the Journal of Economic Perspectives back in 2011 that talks a lot about uh, that literature. 
So these types of models, this so-called drift diffusion model, where you assume diffusion until one of two boundaries is reached with the uh, drift of the diffusion depending on the true difference in value of the two, uh, of the two choices, are uh, typically posited just as a purely descriptive model. You fit the parameters of the model to the data. You discuss how well the model fits various kinds of data. There's no necessary uh, normative interpretation of why decisions should be made in that way. Uh, our paper is interested instead in normative models of decision making between some discrete set of alternatives on the basis of information that arrives as, as a result of a sequential sampling uh, process. It's not the first paper to do something like that. Uh, there are a number of recent analyses that offer normative justifications for at least some aspects of the kind of sequential sampling process assumed in that, uh, in that experimental literature. Uh, Drew Fudenberg and co-authors has a recent paper, and there was an earlier paper in the neuroscience literature by Jan Drugowicz and co-authors. Uh, who assume that the information flow is given by the sample path of some Brownian motion with drift, the same thing that's assumed in the drift diffusion model, but instead of just assuming an arbitrary rule for when the process stops and what decision is made, they endogenize the stopping rule. They ask under a given prior about what the state of the world might be, what's the optimal stopping rule when you have that kind of sequential sampling as the source of information. I have a paper from a couple of years ago that instead assumes the transition rule for the belief states and the stopping rule that the drift diffusion model assumes. In other words, it assumes that the mental belief states have to move back and forth on a line segment, that a decision is made when you reach one uh, end or the other of the line segment. Uh, but it endogenizes the relationship between the state of the world and the diffusion along this line, optimizes that under uh, an information theoretic uh, constraint on the complexity of the information that the subject can get. In this work, we endogenize both the information flow and the stopping rule uh, simultaneously. There's a recent paper by Yun Ku Che and Conrad Mirendorf that also endogenizes both the information flow and the stopping rule in a sequential sampling model of a discrete choice problem. It differs from what I'm going to talk about here today in that they assume a particular uh, quite restrictive class of information structures. It's ones that necessarily involve occasional large jumps in posterior beliefs. In their leading example that they mainly analyze, um, there's a one-time arrival of a jump. Beliefs don't change, or information doesn't arrive until this Poisson jump, at which time a, uh, the posterior jumps enough that the decision is immediately made. We're instead here going to be interested in models of sequential sampling where a little bit of information arrives in every little instant. And there'll be constant movement of the posterior randomly in response to how these little micro experiments um, are, are turning out. Okay, so uh, what is our setup? We first discuss the kind of model that we're interested in in, um, uh, in a discrete time formulation, and then we pass to the limit as the length of time between the successive observations is made um, arbitrarily small. But first to describe the discrete time setup, there's some finite set of actions, finite set of possible states, a payoff that depends on the action in the state, just as in the static problem I was just defining. There'll be some prior beliefs about what the true state of the world is before any of the information sampling occurs. There's going to be now a discrete sequence of times that can extend indefinitely into the future at which it's possible to sample information or decide to terminate and choose an action. E at each of these dates, if one has not terminated before reaching time little t, you can either choose an action, any action in the set capital A, or instead you can decide to make another observation. Making an observation means you'll get a signal S from some finite set of possible signals with some conditional probabilities, and this is going to be an object of choice, what those conditional probabilities of the different signals are conditional on the uh, unknown true state. The nature of this experiment can be different at each of these points in time, uh, little t. The decisions about whether to terminate and also what kind of experiment to do next can depend on the complete history of previous experiments and previous signals received prior to that time. 
Uh, if you do sample information, then you go to period T plus 1 with that new information and again have a similar decision to make. The crucial question, of course, is what do we assume about the cost of more informative experiments? So we're going to assume that each of these experiments has a fixed cost kappa. There's some kind of penalty for delaying decision independently of what kind of experiment you do. And then there's a part of the cost which is going to be increasing in the informativeness of the experiment that you perform. And so this IT is going to be a measure of the informativeness of the experiment. It's raised to a, uh, a power rho. This rho is assumed to be greater than 1 which is going to be the thing that measures how advantageous it is to smooth the rate of information acquisition as opposed to a, wanting to acquire a big lump of information all at one point in time. Uh, you might ask, uh, why is it meaningful to write i to the row instead of just writing i? Uh, and of course we could do that, but we're going to make some assumptions about the measure of informativeness i. And given the smoothness and convexity assumptions we're going to make about our measure of informativeness, raising it to a power rho bigger than 1 will imply additional convexity. It will be a meaningful restriction. It's what's going to deliver the fact that the optimal information sampling will involve only collecting a very small amount of information over any given short time interval. Then there's this multiplicative parameter to index the, uh, the cost of more informative signals. You can think of that as the Lagrange multiplier on a, constri on a problem where instead of a cost of more informative signals, there's an upper bound on the sum over all of the different occasions of this, um, of this i to the rho. But I'm going to talk here about the version of the problem where we suppose the lambda is just given. There's a cost function for more informative experiments. It's going to matter, of course, what this i is. It's going to be some function of the conditional probabilities of the different signals, conditional on the state of the world. It can also depend on what your prior is, um, the, which is going to be the posterior given q sub t, the posterior given observations up to that point may affect also uh, the cost. In the case of the mutual information cost function, it does. Uh, so, for example, again, mutual information would be an example of a cost function of this kind. It's a cost function of this kind where the prior QT uh, does matter. And here I've written mutual information now in terms of the conditional probabilities of the signals and, uh, and the prior. And, and you see it is not independent uh, of that prior. What are we going to assume in general about the nature of our measure of information? Uh, we want our measure of information to be a convex function of these conditional probabilities. We're going to assume that it's twice differentiable in the probabilities. We're going to assume that our measure of information is non-negative for any experiment and it'll be positive except in the case that the experiment is completely uninformative, which means that the probabilities of getting different signals are completely independent of what the true state is. Uh, but zero, uh, it is going to be strictly positive unless you're in that case it's also always going to be zero if you do have purely uninformative signals and finally we're going to assume that a signal that's more informative in the Blackwell ordering will have at least as large a value of our model of informativeness so these are things that we think are um, intuitively desirable features of a measure of information they're all properties that Shannon's mutual information measure for example satisfies but it's far from the only function that satisfies them. Uh, all of these except number two are also the assumptions made in a recent paper on a generalized models of rational inattention by D. Oliveira et al. Um, and so we're basically adopting exactly their assumptions about the cost function for a static problem. It's our assumptions about the cost function for individual experiments in this sequential problem. The thing we're doing that De Oliveira et al. do not assume in their paper is also assuming differentiability. The differentiability is going to be important because in fact we're interested in an asymptotic result uh, in the limit in which the amount of information collected in each individual experiment is going to become infinitesimally small. We're going to be interested in doing a Taylor series expansion to our cost function and uh, so differentiability is going to be important for what we're going to do to get those, uh, those asymptotic results. A class of cost functions, flow cost functions for the individual experiment that we're particularly interested in would make the further assumption that the cost function is prior invariant. It doesn't depend on those prior probabilities at the time of doing the experiment. 
And this is a type of assumption which is standard in the literature on, um, on statistical testing, where one assumes that there's some set of experiments you can do. An experiment has a given cost independently of what the outcome is or what the true situation is uh, when, you, when you do the experiment. And that's the main case uh, we're interested in analyzing. This assumption, together with the ones on the previous slides, will in fact lead us to quite sharp results uh, about um, the consequences of rational inattention in the way that um, the way that we're going to define it. Another special class for which we uh, can give very strong results would be the assumption that this flow cost function is state separable. So we're going to call it state separable if the cost of doing an experiment is the sum of a cost associated with the probabilities of different signals you could get in a given state of the world X which is defined separately for each of those states of the world, weighted by the probability that you assign, it's your prior at the time you do the experiment, to different states of the world uh, being the case. There's a parameter of that cost function, that p hat is some probability distribution that can be tuned to minimize the expected value of this cost. And uh, we'll let that be chosen in a way that can depend on what the, uh, what the prior is. We need that assumption that you can choose that p hat, depending on uh, the situation you're in, in order for the state separable cost function to satisfy our third assumption. That was the assumption that whenever an experiment is completely uninformative, it has zero cost. That couldn't be true of a state separable cost function if the, uh, if the D function were simply a function of, condition, of the probabilities of the signals in state S in a way that uh, couldn't depend on what, um, uh, what, kind of exper what kind of signals you're getting in the other states of the world. Uh, we can introduce dependence here by optimizing the p hat. Now in the case of an experiment where the probabilities of the signals are the same for all states X, then you choose the p hat to be that common probability distribution. We're assuming that this d is in fact a divergence between the, true, the two probability distributions. It'll be zero uh, if, uh, if p and p hat are the same. So in fact, now in the case of any uh, purely uninformative experiment, the cost will be zero uh, under this definition. So this involves uh, a particular specific sort of prior independence. The mutual information cost function is an example of a state separable cost function. And it's in fact uh, the feature of the mutual information cost function that we uh, in fact don't like that results in this fact that it doesn't allow any concept of similarity or difference between different states to be part of uh, your cost function. Uh, but we have a lot of results on what happens in our framework if we assume that the flow cost function has this state separable uh, property. Okay, so the problem we pose is we want to choose a policy. A policy is going to be a stopping rule, given the results of experiments so far. Whether you terminate or not, a rule for action selection, if you reach a stopping point, a rule for the choice of the next experiment that you do after any history which is not a stopping point. You're going to jointly choose those aspects of the policy to maximize the expected utility of your eventual action minus the expected value of the sum of costs of the sequence of experiments that you'll do up to some random date, capital T, at which you first reach a stopping point. The cost is, again, capital plus lambda it to the row. The it is this measure of the informativeness of the experiment done at stage little t using that cost function that has the properties that, um, that we've assumed before. Uh, we can use a dynamic programming approach to solving this problem, and, and, it's, and it's very useful for giving us uh, further insight into the nature of the problem. So after any history t, which has not led you already to terminate, you can define an optimal continuation probability, which is uh, policy, which is the policy uh, from uh, little t onward, which will now maximize the expected value of this thing, which is again the expected value of your eventual action, minus the sum of the costs of the experiments that you do uh, from now on, where this conditional expectation is conditional on the history of outcomes of experiments up until, um, up until period little t. 
one can show that the value of this um, uh, continuation objective under any continuation policy depends only on what the continuation policy is and the posterior QT is the only relevant statistic about that uh, prior uh, about that prior history and so then we can define a value function the maximized value of this continuation value a value function which is just a function of the posterior that you reached at a given point in time QT it'll be independent of what time uh, how much time has elapsed and any other aspect of the previous history of experiments that value function in turn is going to satisfy a Bellman equation the two things on the right hand side of the Bellman equation are you evaluate the expected utility, the highest expected utility you could achieve if you decided to terminate an act now. That's the expected utility uh, evaluated at the posterior that you currently have given the previous history of experiments. Or the other thing that W with the superscript sample um, is the continuation value if you decide not to terminate and sample again. And it's the expected value of the continuation utility when you choose the optimal experiment to do. Um, in this state where you have the posterior QT. It involves a posterior over there on the right hand side which will be the posterior implied by Bayes rule for each of the possible signals that you might get given the experiment that you choose to do at this stage. So solutions to those problems, those inner problems on the right hand side of this Bellman equation are going to yield the optimal stopping rule and the optimal information choice, the optimal kind of experiment to do if you continue to sample at each stage and each of those things will only depend on the posterior QT. So in fact the optimal stopping rule will have the form of defining a part of the probability simplex such that if your posterior reaches that part of the probability simplex you stop sampling. Uh, until you get to that part of the probability sequence simplex, you continue sampling. There will also be an optimal experiment to do at each point in time that depends only on the point in the probability simplex that you've currently reached. We can also um, reformulate this, uh, this dynamic programming problem using a trick that Kamenitsa and, and Genskow use in, um, in their work. Uh, which is to note that the choice of possible signal structures, you can define the set of possible signal structures, if it's as flexible as the set that we're also assuming here, as the set of possible probability distributions over posteriors that you could get to after receiving a signal, subject just to the constraint that the expected value of the posterior uh, using your prior to determine the probabilities of getting different signals has to exactly equal your prior. And so we can formulate our Bellman equation now in terms of not the choice of conditional probabilities of signals, but the choice of a probability distribution over possible posteriors conditioning on the, uh, on the prior that you're currently at to solve uh, the inner problem here. And so then we have a problem of essentially controlled dynamics on the probability simplex uh, where this cost, uh, this cost function of, of performing more informative experiments is going to determine the cost of uh, moving uh, on the probability simplex according to different types of stochastic processes. Okay, so we can reduce our problem to choosing a stochastic process for the posterior beliefs starting from some initial prior uh, together with a stopping rule and an action selection rule. Um, the optimal belief dynamics are going to be a Markov process on the probability simplex that can be defined independently of what the starting point is assumed to be. As I said, the optimal stopping rule will be some closed subset of the probability simplex. You stop as soon as you reach that set. Um, there'll be an optimal action if you reach any point in the stopping set. We obtain stronger characterizations of the uh, nature of the solution to this problem by passing then to a continuous sampling limit that we're interested in. So the limiting case in which these individual signals are only going to be very slightly informative and a very large number of samples will be obtained before uh, reaching the stopping set and before deciding then to take an action. That's going to be a problem that's going to look a lot like the kind of continuous time models of sequential sampling uh, that that literature that I referred to earlier often assumes.
Okay, so our Markov process in this continuous limit is going to become a continuous time diffusion like the drift diffusion model assumes or say like the Fudenberg and co-authors paper assumes. So what's our continuous sampling limit? I'm going to let parameters of the model that I described before now vary with some scale parameter delta, which you can think of as the length of time between the successive opportunities to sample. The payoffs from actions uh, will not depend on delta. My information measure is not going to depend on delta, but the fixed cost is going to scale with delta. We can think now of the parameter kappa as a cost per unit time. As we make the time required to do another experiment shorter, the fixed cost part of the cost of doing an experiment is scaled proportionally to delta. And the information cost is also going to scale with delta. We can think of that lambda coefficient uh, as scaling with delta uh, in, a, in a certain way as well. Um, and this is going to uh, result in a well-defined uh, limiting model as the deltas become small. So we're going to be interested in a sequence of models of the kind I described before as the delta is made arbitrarily small. What we show in the paper is that there's a well-behaved limiting value function in the limit as delta goes to zero. There's a well-defined limiting stopping set, a region of the probability simplex that becomes the stopping set. In, uh, in the limiting case as delta is very close to zero. There's going to be a well-behaved limiting distribution of times required for decision. If times are now not the number of experiments, but the number of experiments divided by delta, there's going to be a well-behaved limiting value for the information collection per unit time, which is going to be the value of that i per experiment divided by the delta, the length of time it takes to get an experiment, and in fact, in this continuous sampling limit, it's going to turn out that that information measure per experiment is going to be constant over time um, over this sampling process. So there's going to be a well-defined numerical quantity of information collection per unit time. That means there's going to be only an infinitesimal amount of information collected in each of the individual experiments. Okay. Now, because the informativeness of each of these individual experiments are going to become infinitesimal in this continuous sampling limit, the only properties of the cost function C that are actually going to matter for our characterization of optimal information sampling in this limiting case are going to be the local behavior of the cost function near purely uninformative information structures. You're not going to perform an experiment that's strictly uninformative because that is of no value and it still has this positive cost. But in the limit as delta is becoming small, you're going to be doing experiments that are not a whole lot different from that. In other words, the probability of getting different signals is not going to be very different in, uh, in different states of the world. So under the assumptions that I made earlier uh, about the cost function, we're going to be able to locally approximate that information measure by a Taylor expansion. And our assumptions, in fact, place strong restrictions on what the coefficients of the Taylor expansion can be like. So under the assumptions one through four on the previous slide, uh, we can do a Taylor expansion if we consider a nearly uninformative information structure that has the form specified at the top of the slide, then there's going to have to be a matrix K of X and X prime for each pair of possible uh, states of the world that may depend on the point in the probability simplex that you've reached that we call the information cost matrix, such that the local quadratic approximation to the cost function has to be of this, uh, of this particular form. Uh, furthermore, this k of x and x prime for any given prior is going to have to be a symmetric positive semi-definite matrix. It's going to have to have a null eigenvector, which is the vector of all ones, uh, and that's going to be the only null eigenvector of the matrix. If we make additional assumptions about the cost function, we can even get stronger conclusions about the local behavior of the cost function. Specifically, if we add the assumption that our flow cost function is prior invariant, now the things on the previous slide are true, and the information cost matrix can't depend on the Q, the point in the price simplex that you're at. So now, to the local approximation, the cost function can be fully specified by a finite number of coefficients that only depend on how many a priori possible states of the world there are. Uh, 
you might say, well, it's still unappealing relative to Sims if it has that uh, finite number of coefficients bigger than one. Uh, Sims has only one free parameter, the overall cost of information or overall bound on mutual information. We argue that it's desirable to have exactly these remaining degrees of freedom in our theory because these are going to be the coefficients that allow us to specify the degree to which it's more costly to distinguish between uh, some states than distinguishing between other states. Uh, another case where we can get strong conclusions is if we assume the flow cost function is state separable, then under assumptions one through four plus state separability, the information cost matrix has to have this specific form with only one free parameter, this multiplicative constant K, which means that to this local approximation, any state separable cost function is in fact equivalent to some multiple of mutual information. So we made more general assumptions. If we assume state separability, we might as well have just assumed the cost function was mutual information in this asymptotic case. Okay, so then what kind of things can we show about the asymptotic case? Uh, our Bellman equation now reduces to this simpler kind of equation where we're going to choose a direction uh, a vector A in the tangent space of the probability simplex for each point in the probability simplex that you might be at to maximize uh, that function where that quadratic form A prime K bar A uh, is, uses a K bar matrix that's defined in the way uh, down here. And that just follows from our local of approximation to the cost function. Uh, what kind of things can we conclude? Um, one, um, one thing we conclude is we can define this vector A of Q. Once we solve for the value function, we can find the vector A of Q at each point in the probability simplex that solves that maximization problem on the previous slide. Um, it's in fact going to be uniquely defined up to sign for generic points in the probability simplex. That's going to identify the infinitesimal experiment that it's optimal to conduct if you reach that posterior from your previous sampling. And so then the posterior is going to evolve from that point uh, as a Brownian motion with zero drift. It has to have zero drift because it has to be a martingale and an instantaneous variance that's determined by this vector A. So this vector A is uh, indicating the only direction locally that the posterior can be changing as a result of the optimal experiment that you perform at that point in time. Another result we get is that um, there's going to be a unique terminal belief state associated with each of the actions. Uh, there's going to be the same posterior. There's going to be the same posterior whenever you choose some action A. And so uh, that's going to depend on the prior that you start from. But starting from a given prior, it's going to turn out that all of the dynamics of beliefs um, are always moving in a convex combination of this particular finite set of possible posteriors that you might reach at the time that you take an action. That's going to be regardless of the number of, of possible states. What that means is, say, in the case of a binary choice problem, you're going to move on a line in the space of posteriors, so as the drift diffusion model assumed. So that might have seemed a very arbitrary assumption in the drift diffusion model that uh, in a situation where there are many possible situations, many possible stimuli the subject might be presented with, that there's a single dimensional mental state variable that will move back and forth on a line until you reach one of the endpoints. That is necessarily a property of optimal information sampling in our model if you're making a choice between uh, two actions. It is not uh, a feature of optimal information sampling in the paper of Fudenberg et al. or Drugowicz et al. Uh, posteriors move in a larger dimensional space uh, under the optimal stopping rule, under the kind of experimentation they're assuming. That's because they're assuming a fixed kind of experiment rather than optimizing the experiment you can do at each point in time. We show that allowing a more flexible set of possible experiments and optimizing the experiment that's done locally, you end up getting a simpler characterization of how beliefs are going to move in the space of posteriors. Um, I think I'm almost out of time, so let me um, uh, tell you what our main results are about some special cases. In the case of the state separable flow information cost function, we get a strong, uh, we, uh, we can get an analytical characterization 
for the value function that solves this Bellman equation. It turns out that the value function and the conditional probabilities of eventually choosing different actions are the same as in an equivalent static rational inattention problem where you assume the mutual information cost function as in that static problem I started the talk with. So we have um, a justification in terms of sequential information sampling for that kind of static rational inattention problem. We don't have to appeal to the Shannon coding theorems to justify an interest in, uh, in Sims's cost functions. So if you like conclusions that follow from that kind of static model, like the fact that it can uh, predict logistic choice, that the probability of choosing between a finite set of options is a logistic function of the relative value to the decision maker of the different options, uh, we get that result out of this kind of sequential sampling model. There are other recent papers that have also shown that you can get logistic choice as a prediction for other related kinds of sequential sampling models. But we're not really interested in this result because, as I pointed out, we don't like this assumption of state separability as a restriction on the cost function. What if we assume instead the prior invariant cost function? Now we have a finitely parameterized family of problems that we can study. We can solve the Bellman equation numerically for any given specification of the finite set of parameters. We find some interesting things. I want to leave you with just one example of what uh, we think is uh, interesting about this alternative theory compared to the Sims theory of rational attention. So suppose we have a simple example. There are two n possible states. They can be ordered on a line. Say there are different degrees of motion strength from strongest motion to the left to strongest motion to the right. Uh, I'll suppose here the prior is that each of those states is equally likely, ex ante, to be the situation the decision maker is in. Uh, the task is to classify the stimulus as belonging to one of two classes, either say left or right. Your reward will be plus one uh, if uh, you're in any of the uh, states that are bigger, greater than or equal to n plus one. Uh, you'll be correct if you say left and the state is anything up to capital N. I'm going to compare the results under two possible information cost functions. One is mutual information, standard rational and attention theory. The other one is the sequentially prior invariant cost function where the K matrix has this particular form. Uh, this form of K matrix means that our cost function penalizes only differences in the signal probabilities between neighboring states. So it's only costly to perform an experiment to the extent that two neighboring states, in terms of where they're ordered on the line, have different conditional probabilities of receiving uh, different signals. And so this is incorporating the idea that similar stimuli in the sense of ones that are nearer on that line are harder to distinguish than stimuli that are further apart on the line. And so this is a, uh, the numerical result we get. The red line is the optimal probability or the pro predicted probability that the subject will say right as a function of what the true state is for a particular choice of the information cost parameter. And as I said before, there has to be a discontinuous jump when the true answer switches from being left to being right uh, under ra standard rational inattention. Here is the prediction under our sequentially prior invariant problem. The blue line is the predicted probability of the subject saying right. Uh, you see it increases uh, monotonically uh, as you proceed from the strongest leftward motion to the strongest rightward motion. That's like what the experimental evidence looks like. Okay, so we've introduced a finitely parameterized family of cost functions for rational inattention problems that we can interpret in terms of a model of sequential information sampling. Uh, it makes uh, relatively sharp predictions because apart from the prior over states and the state dependent utilities of the different actions, predicted choice frequencies only depend on those data and this finite set of elements of the information cost matrix. As I said, we don't think it's undesirable that there are the additional free parameters of the number that there are because these have an interpretation. They allow us to specify the relative difficulty of distinguishing different states. And we think the predictions of this alternative rational inattention theory are more consistent uh, than the standard theory with at least some aspects of empirical performance on perceptual discrimination tasks like the one that uh, I just showed you. Thanks.